Hi everyone, today I am going to read a true story about a young girl who marched in the civil rights movement over 50 years ago. You may have heard about the protests that have been happening recently. A protest is when people work together to make their voices heard and change laws. There are many ways to protest, and one is by marching. You may have heard of Dr. Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement in school. That history is still being made today by protests that are happening and through the Black Lives Matter movement. It's part of our civic duty as people living in the United States to vote, but it's also part of our civic duty to protest and speak out about laws that are unjust and unfair and make our country a better place for everyone to live in. About a month ago, we celebrated the women's right to vote and we learned about how through protests, the suffragists were able to gain women the right to vote. The protests that are happening now are much the same, but today we're protesting to help protect and make life better for African Americans living in the United States. Because people can be judged by the color of their skin and it makes life a lot harder and more dangerous. If you saw someone being treated unfairly, would you speak up and say something? Have you ever been treated unfairly? How did it make you feel? Do you think that you're too young to speak up and make a difference? When we see other people being hurt or treated unfairly, we need to be bold and speak out against that and help that person or those people. Let's see how Audrey speaks out when she sees something happening that is not right. The Youngest Marcher, the story of Audrey Faye Hendricks, a young civil rights activist by Cynthia Levinson, illustrated by Vanessa Brantley Newton. Whenever Mike flew into town, Audrey and her mama cooked barbecued ribs, stewed greens, sweet potato souffle, and Audrey's favorite, hot rolls baptized in butter. Other folks knew Mike as Martin or Dr. King. The Hendrixes used his nickname. They did the same with the other ministers too like Fred Shuttlesworth and Jim Bevel. After Mike blessed the feast, Mama expected Audrey to keep still during supper. But when grown-ups talked about wiping out the segregation laws that kept black and white people apart in Birmingham, she just had to speak up. Audrey intended to go places and do things like anybody else. I want to eat my ice cream inside Newberry's. I want to sit downstairs at the Alabama. I don't want hand-me-down school books, but stools at the counter, plush movie theater seats, books so fresh they'd crackle when you open them. Those were for white children. Hush, hissed Mama. Nine-year-old children should not speak in front of company, especially ministers like Mike, Fred, and Jim, who were bringing dreams of justice. Audrey knew all about segregation. She knew to pay the driver at the front of the bus, then step off and walk around to the back door. Drink from the fountain with the dirty water bowl and warm water. Use the freight elevator at department stores downtown. Front row seats, cool water, elevators with white gloved operators. Laws said those were for white folks. Every Monday night, Audrey and her mama and daddy and her aunts, uncles, and cousins joined neighbors and friends at Fred's church for worship, fellowship, and testimony. She sang and swayed along with the movement choir, her voice spirited and spiritual. Black and white together, we shall overcome. Then came testimonies. White store owners won't hire me. Ku Kluxers chased me. Policemen called me names. The hateful stories made Audrey squirm. She tried to tell her mama, that's not right. Shh. How could mama expect her to hush? She had to make things right, but what could she do? When Mike visited Fred's church, thousands of people crowded around her to hear him preach. 
in a voice as taut as steel cables, as smooth as glass. He intoned, Segregation is morally wrong and sinful. That's true. Fired up, Audrey sat taller. An unjust law is no law at all, he proclaimed. Audrey had listened to Mike explain his plan at her supper table and knew what he meant. If a law is unjust, disobey it. Sit down inside, Newberries. Picket those white stores. March to protest those unfair laws. Why, even marching was against the law. Then, get arrested. Fill the jails, Mike exclaimed. Fill Birmingham's jails so full that policemen can't squeeze in one more person. Pack cells so tight, the police will have to quit arresting people for demanding their rights. Audrey just knew Mike's plan would work. She twisted in her pew to see which grown-ups would walk down the aisle, volunteer for jail. But they mostly stayed put, eyes staring at their feet, hands on their knees. Feet, hands, and knees didn't move. Fill the jails, Mike pleaded, meeting after meeting, but heads shook. All around her, Audrey heard, no, best not break those segregation laws. Bossman will fire me. Landlord will evict me. Policeman will beat me. If nobody protested, Mike's plan would fail. Police could keep arresting anyone, anytime, for anything, forever. Audrey would never be able to go places and do things like everybody else. One night, Jim announced a new idea. If grown-ups won't do it, fill the jails with children. Audrey leaped to her feet. I want to go to jail, she declared. Mama looked deep and saw that Audrey's eyes begged, please. Okay, Mama said. Audrey strutted down that aisle. She was going to jail. Two mornings later, she put on a fresh pressed pinafore and shiny Mary Janes with turned down socks. Protesters got to look nice. In the meantime, her daddy bought her a game to help her pass the time in jail. Her mama and daddy took her by the Central Street Elementary to tell her teacher she'd be absent, maybe for a whole week. Miss Wills wrapped her arms around her. Audrey knew she was proud of her. She said goodbye to her grandparents. You'll be fine, her grandmother said. She knew Audrey would be brave. So did Audrey. Then her mama and daddy drove to her 16th Street Baptist Church, where the children were gathering. Even before she reached the door, Audrey heard loud voices chanting freedom songs. Inside, hundreds of big kids called out to friends and crowded around signs for their high schools, Parker, Carver. Her head swiveled. Where was the sign for Center Street Elementary? She was the only protester from her school, the youngest child in the whole church, and she knew no one. Audrey huddled by her parents in the basement. But when Jim lined her up with the others, two by two, and the door swung open, Audrey straightened up. She was going to break a law and go to jail to help make things right. Clutching a protest sign in one hand and her game in the other, Audrey marched out the door. She stomped and sang, Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Half a block from the church, a white policeman stopped Audrey. He pointed toward a police van. Sentence, one week in juvenile hall. A matron locked Audrey into a day room with two dozen other girls, all older, all bigger, all strangers. Audrey sat down alone and slipped the cover off her game. I told you to sit down, the matron yelled. Audrey jumped. She didn't remember standing up. The matron dragged her to a dark, empty room. When I tell you something, do it, she commanded, or I'll leave you here. Trembling, Audrey quietly followed the matron back to the day room, put away her game, lay down her head, and cried. Jail was harder than she'd thought, and she wasn't fine after all. By evening, Audrey was hungry and tired. For dinner, 
soupy, oily, tasteless grits. At night, a bare mattress with one thin sheet for a cover. The next morning, uh uh-oh, no fresh underwear, no clean pinafore, no toothbrush. Audrey and her cellmates were led outdoors into an empty concrete pen surrounded by high prison walls. The other girls talked together. Audrey wondered what her classmates were doing. Miss Wills would be keeping them busy. On another day, Audrey was sent to a huge room and told to sit in a chair that was so high, her feet dangled above the floor. Four white men glared at her. She'd never talked to a white man before. Are you against America? One demanded to know. No, sir, she answered politely. What do you talk about at those meetings? Another asked. Our freedom. Why did you march? To go places and do things like anybody else. What was wrong with that? Every mealtime, Audrey stared at greasy grits. She could barely spoon them into her mouth, let alone swallow them. Every night, the cot's wire springs jabbed. Every morning, she had nothing to do but sit alone with her game. In the afternoons, though, more kids crowded into the day room. Some days, many of them arrived sopping wet. A girl explained that firemen aimed powerful hoses at the children. Surging water spun them off their feet and down the street. They got up and kept marching anyway, until they too were sent to jail. By Audrey's fifth day in detention, the police couldn't squeeze in one more person. We filled up all the rooms. We filled up all the rooms. Audrey practically jumped up and down. She was so proud. Watching television in the day room, she saw black people stroll straight into stores and restaurants like they belonged there. No one else could be sent to jail. Everything had changed. After seven days, Audrey went home. Her mama and daddy wrapped their arms tight around her, washed the jail off her, and for dinner, hot rolls baptized in butter. Two months later, the city of Birmingham wiped segregation laws clean off the books. Audrey licked her spoon clean at Newberry's counter, like everybody else. Black and white together, like we belong. Do you think Audrey was bold and brave to volunteer to march and go to jail? I definitely do. Did you notice how it was the children who were bold and spoke out and volunteered to go to jail when the adults couldn't or were afraid to? It can be easier to pretend like you didn't see something or ignore it rather than stick up for yourselves or others. For instance, maybe you saw a classmate getting bullied or made fun of at school and instead of stopping the bully or helping that person, you just looked the other way or maybe you walked away. Maybe you were just glad that it wasn't you being bullied. It can be intimidating to speak out, especially if doing so makes you a target as well. It can also be really easy to say that something doesn't affect you. Yeah, someone's getting bullied, but it's not you or your friend, so you sit back. But we have to be bold and stick up for each other because you never know when you'll need someone to stick up for you. That's why I hope you'll join me in supporting all people and supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. For an activity, I want you to think and write or draw about what equality for everyone looks like and means to you. Why do you think that it's important that everyone be treated fairly? And before you think that it doesn't affect you, remember, women are still fighting for their equal rights too. I hope you enjoyed the book and learning about this amazingly brave and bold girl. And I encourage you to find ways that you can stick up and speak out in your life, whether it's helping your sibling or a classmate or your friend. And I encourage you to learn more about the Black Lives Matter movement. Bye.